Thank you, Toby. <laughs> Can everyone take their seats? Lovely. I know the food is too good. The company is too interesting. The, the exhibition is too fascinating to come back, but there's more and there's some really good presentations this afternoon. So if everyone can take their seats, we'll get started on the afternoon session. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kate Roberts. I'm here from CADU, part of the Welsh contingent. I'm CADU's chief inspector of ancient monuments and historic buildings. Uh, CADU, for those of you who don't know, is the Welsh Government's Historic Environment Service. We're responsible for the protection of the historic environment. And as such, we are one of the very grateful recipients of all of this wonderful data and information that's coming out of the Cherish project, which will help us immensely in our challenge to care for the historic environment and to deal with the challenges that we all face through climate change. We've had some fantastic papers this morning, and I know you're all going to enjoy this session that we have this afternoon, uh, well, both sessions this afternoon, but the first session, which I'm going to chair, is about raising the awareness of the climate change and the impact on the historic environment. So we've got four presentations, and without further ado, I'm going to ask Hannah Genders Boyd, who is here from the Royal Commission, to kick things off with her presentation on communicating climate heritage. Oh, sorry, I forgot the Slido. I forgot the Slido. Yeah, I just realized. Uh, I got in, I'll, I'll be shot. Uh, okay, so remember, Slido is operating. You can ask your questions, and I understand we have one more quiz. Do we have one more quiz? We do. So if everyone's fingers on the ready, I was very proud. I came fifth in the last one, so I'm a bit disappointed I don't get to be in this one. But so if you're in the runners up, I think you get a score. Is it now live? Are we good? So if fingers at the ready, Slido quiz up and running, and I will hand over to Hannah while you're all working your way through the quiz. Grand, thanks very much. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Hannah Genders boyd I'm the Survey and Outreach Officer with the Royal Commission for Wales. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about communicating, how, how communication and engagement has been approached over the course of the Cherish project and how um, it's going to be approached going forward, and that's particularly within the Royal Commission. Grant, so um, I called this talk Communicating Climate Heritage, um, and as this is a, a relatively new field um, with the potential to have quite a wide remit and encompass a number of different aspects, I thought it'd be worth contextualising and, and clarifying that term before I kick off. Um, so in this context, I would say that Climate heritage is about working together at the intersection of archaeology and climate change research, using each discipline to inform the other. And this is in order to understand the effects of climate change on heritage and to create mitigation and adaptation strategies pertaining to the historic environment. So with that definition in mind, uh, we can start to think about the huge potential for outreach and engaging people with each side of the story there. And that is exactly what Cherish has aimed to do. Communicating our research has been central to the project throughout. Five of the 11 Cherish initiatives focused on engaging general and professional audiences. There are currently three dedicated comms and outreach positions within Cherish across our four partners. Um, but a really key aspect, and, uh, and I think something that can be deemed a lesson learned from the project, is that every team member has played an active role in this aspect of the work which has meant a lot of teamwork and collaboration, but it's really been built into how we work as a project. It means that all of the team know when we start research that we're gonna be telling people about it at some point, and that's just as important as the research itself. As we all know, Cherish was made possible with EU funds, and that means that all the data we create is freely available, and we're currently working very hard to ensure that it's also freely accessible. And by being made available on um, the, the archive systems for both Wales and Ireland. And that's really a core value of Cherish. Everything we create is made to be shared. But before I talk more about the work of Cherish, let's delve a little bit deeper into what it means to be doing outreach and communication in this field of, of climate heritage and why that can be so powerful. The first thing I've written up there is, is audiences. Um, and it's, I think it's this, this intersectionality of climate heritage that gives us an amazing opportunity to reach new audiences. We have the chance to engage those who are interested in heritage and archaeology with climate change. And we've also got the chance to engage those who are interested in climate change and sustainability with archaeology. 
And that's something I'll come back to a little bit later on. Um, but we've always tried to be mindful of, of the fact that we have this opportunity to, to reach new audiences, and we're always trying to do that. Um, engaging with those new audiences is all about values, and it's maybe also a question of scale. Um, engaging, we, as archaeologists, we've, we've got the opportunity to engage with what people value. And that helps to answer some really tricky and some really big questions. Why are we trying to stop climate change? Why do we have carbon goals and mitigation strategies globally, nationally, and like within our organizations? It can be really hard for all of us to connect with that global perspective. Like academically, we know that it's important to keep global temperatures below 1.5 degrees of warming from a global justice perspective. But that can be a difficult thing for people to fully comprehend and integrate into their lived experience of, of their lives and, and their world around them. But showing the, the current immediate effects of climate change on heritage, on someone's doorstep, is really powerful. And that's because of connection, that's because of the emotional connection that people can have with their heritage. So it's a really good way to help people connect the dots about what climate change means for us here today. Next point I've got there, SICOM, science communication. Is, is a bit more in relation to engaging general audiences than professional audiences. But the need to clearly and accurately communicate climate data, sometimes in the face of misunderstanding or misinformation, is a good reminder to all of us in archaeology that when we're communicating about our subject, what we're doing is science communication. That's something that Cherish has taken very seriously, and we're, we're very keen on communicating our methodologies as much as telling stories about sites, as valid as that is. And the final point there, climate action. In communicating climate science in this engaging and connective and integrated way, this is powerful and important climate action. And it's really worth remembering that communicating about climate heritage is an important piece of the puzzle in global, global climate action. So, how has Cherish gone about doing this? Well, throughout the project, engaging people with our research has been done in a multitude of ways. Um, one, of our, one of our aims is raising awareness for coastal communities, providing a long-term context regarding the dynamic nature of our coast. And therefore, we've taken our research out to communities on the coast. Um, this has been done with, with walks on the coastal path in Wales. That's a wonderful resource we have over in Wales. Here in Ireland, the team took it one step further and got people out on the water on kayaks. And we've done community excavations, we've done site tours, we've increased our reach through TV, radio and media appearances, and we've used social media extensively. And we've worked with the next generation in schools, which is something that is increasingly important going forward, and that's therefore something I'll come back to a bit later on as well. Um, <clears throat> getting members of the public out on site through guided walks and site tours has been particularly effective. This is you know, one of those really important moments for connection, for, for getting people to engage meaningfully with their local archaeological sites and offering a new understanding to sites that they might already care about and engage with in different ways. And I think, particularly after COVID, that's something that we all really valued, was being, all being able to get out on site with, with real people and see us all face to face. But that opportunity to connect with local stakeholders and hear about their values and their views on sites is really important. And um, as, as well as that, that's, you know, that moment of connection is, is fantastic as, as an engagement and outreach. It's also been really useful from a research perspective, which I think um, Sarah mentioned earlier, having people as um, eyes on the ground, people who have local knowledge and a local relationship with the site has been important for keeping us informed about sites for monitoring and recording purposes. So, for example, having people who can call us or send us photographs when sands have moved, so shipwrecks or pizza are exposed and showing well, is really helpful. So those, those opportunities for connection are really valuable for us. Um, throughout all of this, um, the question of accessibility has been really important to consider. Working in the coastal zone can be inherently inaccessible, um, just because of the topography. Um, so this can require a bit of a creative response at times. Um, and this is a nice example of that. Last year we created an armchair walk, uh, where myself and Toby went out on site at Plimpton Bay Promontory Fort in Pembrokeshire. Um, and, and filmed a, a live action tour of the site, which was then released by the internet. Um, and that, for that, we received some really positive feedback from like, stakeholders who would never have been able to join us on site for various reasons. So, um, oh, that's a skip to Heather. Eh? Um, so anyway, that was, a, that was a, good, a, good, a good learning there, I think, in trying something new. Um, but skipping onto that side we were on there. Um, another barrier to, to archaeology can, of course, be financial. Um, so we responded to that 
by last year creating some funded placements for the exhibition at Coravai that was run by Dig Ventures last year. And again, we've got some really positive feedback from people involved with that about the opportunities that that opened up for them and the career paths that that opportunity opened up for them. So another way of uh, increasing our reach has been through our exhibitions that hopefully now many of you have seen today. So I'll just speak about these quite briefly. Um, but these are our, our bilingual travelling exhibitions. There's one for Wales and there's one for Ireland. And what you're seeing today is quite special because we've got panels from both Wales and Ireland here. So that's, that's a bit of an unusual treat. Um, but these exhibitions, they, we've got illustrations that there from Caris Tate. We're using images and poetry to communicate our research. So that's a little bit of that science communication that I was mentioning earlier. Um, these exhibitions have extended the reach of our, of our research far beyond what our team members alone, alone could have ever done. Um, we can't go and stand in a museum for six weeks at a time, but the museums can and they can take our research there. Um, and that's offering a way to reach new audiences, as I mentioned before. In this instance, um, you can see there, that's our Welsh exhibition in the Senedd building, being opened by Julie James, who we met earlier. Um, and that's our exhibition taking our research straight to the policymakers, straight to the heart of lawmaking, and that's really where it needs to be. And in the coming months, after the end date of the project, um, the Welsh exhibition will be heading out to sustainability and nature-focused organisations in order to engage those audiences with heritage and the effects of climate change on archaeology. And here in Ireland, the exhibition will be headed down to Trilly Library from May 8th to 20th, so you can see it there if you're around. Um, some of our really important phase two uh, outputs have been um, for outreach and engagement have been the learning resources. Um, Dr. Harriet Robson at Aberystwyth University has created these, these new resources for school-aged children. And again, you might have seen some of them in the poddle room earlier. Um, these are for both Wales and Ireland, um, and in Wales, working with the new school curriculum there. These are offering a way for teachers to talk about climate change, which can be a really difficult subject for primary school-aged children. Um, but this is an opportunity to talk about the cherished research. These are sites that children might know about. It's an opportunity to start discussing that long-term landscape change and, and dynamic nature of the coast and it can be quite a helpful way to introduce the subject. So these resources that, that, were, that have been created offer an in-depth pack for teachers and hands-on learning for children um, and yeah that's obviously including that brilliant model that you'll all have seen in the poddle room. Um, as well as that we're creating visual resources so we're working on creating an animation to illustrate landscape change at dinner since through time and that will be suitable for both children and adults which is um, great to see. Ooh. And um, just to finish up, um, thinking about like this, this way that things like the exhibition and the learning resources will be taking our research forward after the end of the project, which is obviously not so far away now, these will be extending the reach of the, of the cherished research beyond the, the period that we'll all be working on it. Um, you know, those resources will continue to be in the curriculum for many years to come. And, Another aspect of that cherished legacy and that kind of reach beyond the end of the project is the professional engagement that's gone on as part of this project. And that's been so important. That's you know, been a really a key aspect of our communication and engagement strategy. Um, having events like today, where we, we have the opportunity to open up these conversations around climate heritage and start these ideas rolling, that's a really important opportunity to engage with, state, with professional stakeholders within the heritage sector. And that's so important for sharing our research, taking it forward, taking these ideas into new and different organisations and taking the best practice that's been developed through Cherish forward into new projects. And that's really essential in order to continue this, this important work at the intersection of climate change and archaeological research. Jochen Bauer, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Hannah. That was a wonderful overview of raising awareness across the Cherish project. We've now got two case studies which are going to look at individual works. And our first one is from Robbie Galvin, who's going to talk about the Copper Coast Geopark. Great. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, so this is going to be a case study about how we worked with Cherish over the past five years and the benefits that we got from doing that and the activities that we did in our area. But first, um, a little bit about us. Is that not supposed to come up there? Oh yeah, cool. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Copper Coast UNESCO Global Geopark, our experience with Cherish. What we are as a geopark is, well, we're a UNESCO program. We're, this is how UNESCO defines us. 
It's an area of particular geological heritage with international significance that also has a sustainable development plan that incorporates local communities to, I suppose, improve the area, improve the livelihoods of people, and improve the, sustainable, the sustainability of the place through this designation. Every four years, UNESCO actually comes and evaluates us. We get two people who do a kind of an audit of us to make sure that we're still operating. And if that's all good, then we get a green card, keep going for another four years, a yellow card, or we're told to stop if we're doing something terrible. But uh, generally, uh, we, this is, I suppose I have this because it says we, we want to and we need to do, you need to continue doing things. It's not just like a World Heritage Site where you have it and then you, just, you never lose it, more or less. So uh, the organization that does all this is the organization that I work for, is the Copper Coast UNESCO Global Geopark, Copper Coast Geopark Limited. We're a nonprofit company, a charity, basically like a local development company. We have a board made up of volunteers from the local community. Uh, we also have a number of other volunteers on a regular basis. I work for the organization. We have one other employee. There's two other geoparks like us in Ireland that are UNESCO Global Geoparks, one in Clare and one in on the border between Cavan and Fermanagh. Uh, and we're part funded by the Geological Survey Ireland and our local authority. But we also make some revenue through a visitor center that we run and uh, some activities that we do. So it's just to give you a bit of a background. So working with Cherish, uh, we we made first came into contact with Cherish in 2018, um, basically through the Geological Survey of Ireland, and we had an immediate link because well first of all, Cherish were using our area, the Copper Coast, which is I should have said is a is a 17 kilometer stretch of coastline in southeast Ireland. I'll just go back a little bit. I used the Cherish map to sort of show where we are. If you know the geography of Ireland, we're about an hour and a half east of Cork City and about two hours south of where we are now. Um, but once we came into contact with Cherish, we saw an immediate synergy there. Um, in terms of engagement and outreach, we ran events immediately for Heritage Week in our visitor center. We had a talk about uh, the preliminary findings of Cherish at that point it was very, very well attended. We found that the local people that we work with were extremely interested in this. It's even more so, well, I hate to say it, but archaeology is sometimes a bit more interesting than geology because it sort of has that human tangibility to it. And that was wonderful the way Cherish linked that directly to climate change and to the environmental processes that change as well. So it was a perfect fit for us. From then, we went on to do a number of other events uh, for, Cher for Heritage Week in 2018, 2019. And Heritage Week, just in case you don't know, in Ireland is a week of heritage-related events, which we've always participated in. Um, and we also uh, leveraged the expertise of Cherish. Uh, for example, we had uh, Kieran Craven uh, give a talk for Science Week, as well as for another local science festival. And it's great to be able to bring experts in climate change to local audiences in a locally relevant way. And I suppose the culmination of this, which was probably the project that we're most uh, happy with going forward, was this uh, coastal monitoring pilot project. Uh, Kieran mentioned this previously, but it was uh, just to go into a little bit more detail about this. I have it on the top right, what it's about. You kind of see that there. Uh, we ran an event about it, but basically it was, um, it was a survey, a kind of a custom survey developed on an app called Survey123. So it's very easily accessible and quickly uh, made thing that uh, Cherish did and alongside us to kind of iterate on it. Um, we doing it through our insurance and through all the logistics of it. And basically it's a, a way for local people or for anybody in fact to, uh, to log, uh, to go to a coastal site, uh, a designated coastal site on the app to uh, note that it's changed since the last time they were there, to note when the last time they were there was, and then to upload that to our like, map database there. You can see all the different sites. Uh, really great, collaborative. We had an event in 20, 20, 2021 where Kieran kind of walks people through it. And we, we did a pilot program with 10 volunteers and we got two schools engaged as well. So we got over 100 records collected, which was great. It's not a huge amount, but it was a very good uh, outcome. People were very fond of it. We learned a lot from this as well because we saw that you know, you actually can't just develop a thing and expect people to go and do the thing. You actually have to keep engaging them with it, even if it's really, really interesting. So obviously we'd do something and there'd be a spike in engagement, but then afterwards it would uh, kind of drop off. But it was very interesting and it's actually inspired us in a new interreg application that we've made for a project called SEARCH, which is a terrible acronym. acronym. As you can see, it's got a coastal with a big S, ecosystem management for climate change. I actually 
mistakenly said it had the word heritage in it earlier. That's how well I know it. Um, but yeah, we just submitted this to Interreg Atlantic Area for funding. So and if we get this, we'll be developing that project that we did with Cherish along with our partners in, Fran in France, Spain, and Portugal into a wider European Atlantic Area context. This is our final slide, and from here, we continue to uh, basically give people cherish material from our visitor center. We are facilitating a bit of engagement with some local tourism networks right now to get results out there and to help people you know, get as much out of this as possible, because it really, and I hate to use the word, valorized a lot of our area, and it added real value to it by showing people a part of their heritage that was always there, but that wasn't so well known about promontory forts and also about how that's changing in a real, tangibly noticeable way. So yeah, that was, that's the end of my case study and my presentation, but thank you very much. Thank you, and for our second case study today, we have Cathy Laws here who's gonna talk about the Dinas Dinsler uh, project, uh, Element of Cherish. Uh, we've seen Dinas Dinsler appear quite a few times already today, but there's still plenty to be heard about it. Thank you, Cathy. Good afternoon. Um, so as Kate mentioned, you've already heard um, a little bit about Dinas Dinsler, and I hope this will just draw together everything that's um, taken place over the last few years at Dinas Dinsler. Um, so Dinas Dinsler is a coastal hill fort located at the heart, at the head of the Llyn Peninsula on the west coast of Gwynedd. It is a site of national importance protected as a scheduled monument, but is also a site of special scientific interest for its geological significance. The hill fort is constructed on a mound of glacial moraine, which is of particular interest and is readily accessible for geological study. The hill fort likely dates from the Iron Age with strong evidence for continuation of occupation or reoccupation into the Roman period. The site is also associated with early medieval Welsh literature and folklore, being referred to in the fourth branch of the Mabinogion. The images here are just a few of those captured by UAV re reconnaissance survey undertaken at the outset of the project as a baseline record, but continuing throughout the project as part of the monitoring of erosion processes on the cliff edge, and also to capture certain events such as the excavations taking place from the air. You can see that a large part of the western side of the site has been lost, and active erosion of the cliff face is apparent. The site is a very public place. The beach below, um, the site being a popular destination for both locals and holidaymakers. Continued UAV surveys have charted, have charted ongoing erosion. Cherif team members have been able to respond to, to storm events to record cliff face collapses. A new terrestrial laser survey combined with the UAV survey provides a centimetre accurate 3D model of the hill fort and of the eroding cliff face. Fixed survey markers have been inserted to allow accurate comparison with subsequent surveys. Rope access examination of the cliff face with archaeologists and geomorphologists working side by side has provided clarity on archaeological features exposed in the cliff face and on the erosion processes taking place. Paleo-environmental work in and around the hill fort has allowed for reconstruction of the landscape in the past. Bathymetric survey of the shallow marine zone combined with LIDAR has created a seamless offshore, onshore coastal terrain model to assist understanding of how the intertidal zone has changed through time. Cherish undertook desktop research of historic maps to chart past rates of erosion. This suggests that between 20 metres and 40 metres of the western side of the hill fort has been lost over the last 100 years. Climate change projections predict sea level rise, increasing storminess, warmer, wetter winters and hotter, drier summers. This means that the rate of erosion is set to increase with the possibility of losing the whole monument over the next few centuries. The eroding cliff top is only approximately nine metres from the um, archaeological features visible under excavation in the photograph on the right. They're going to start to disappear quite soon. The erosion processes have become much clearer through the work of the project. 
Strong rain, winds and rain from the sea erode the softer sand sediments of the cliff face, leaving a scarred shelf at the junction with the harder glacial sediments. Actions of birds and mammals also play a part in destabilizing um, the softer sediments, and the overall effect is the slumping and de degradation of the overlaying turf. Rain falling on the surface of the fort's interior passes more easily through the sand units, emerging at the cliff face at the junction between the soft and hard sediments, promoting gravitational and rotational slumping and further degradation of the softer sediments. The periodic capture of 3D data of the cliff face and comparative modelling of change between data sets will allow the rate and progress of erosion to be charted going forwards. A suite of geophysical surveys was commissioned by Cherish to give the best possible insight to non-visible archaeological remains. Magnetic data was gathered by Gwynedd Archaeological Trust within and around the hill fort and on a field to the south, while electrical resistance data was collected by Eden Mapping, targeting a mound in the northeast corner of the hill fort interior looking for structural remains. The interpretation diagram on the left shows the results of these and allow for pos po uh, positioning of subsequent archaeological evaluation trenches. This was followed up by ground penetrating radar undertaken by Sumo Geophysics Limited in the interior of the hill fort. The, top, the plot top middle is a time slice taken at 0.8 metres depth. The results from all time slices is combined in the interpretation diagram below and added to the magnetic and resistance data on the right. An initial evaluation excavation was undertaken in summer 2019. Features identified close to the cliff edge by the geophysical survey were targeted along with a series of trenches in the field to the south. The evaluation was undertaken as a community-based excavation led by professional archaeologists from Gwynedd Archaeological Trust, commissioned by the Cherish Project. The community involvement was, was extended to local schools, the Young Archaeologists Club, and the generally curious via site visits, an open day, a dig diary on Facebook, and just talking to passers-by. Archaeologically, it became apparent very quickly that features in both the interior of the hill fort and the field to the south lie below a significant depth of wind-blown sand. Sheriff responded to this realisation by arranging for the ground probing radar survey to pick up features at greater depth than may not have been recorded by other means. As you heard earlier, ongoing research with OSL dating is helping us to clarify the sequence of these sand deposits. Um, in the interior of the hill fort, we got um, the first glimpse of a substantial stone-built roundhouse, approximately 13 metres in diameter, with walls up to 2.4 metres wide and between three and four courses high. Roman pottery was recovered along with metal ob objects of potential Iron Age date. In the field to the south, domestic and agricultural activity dating from the Neolithic, medieval and post-medieval periods was recorded. As you can imagine, the evaluation excavation work has sparked a huge amount of interest. With support from CADU, the AOMB and Bangor University, and with ongoing support from Cherish, Two further seasons of community excavation within the Hillfort interior were completed, once again led by Gwynedd Archaeological Trust. In 2021, features identified in the evaluation trenches in the Hillfort interior were more fully excavated, and then in 2022, the excavation of the roundhouse was completed. Once again, training volunteers in archaeological excavation techniques and interaction with the local community was a key objective. Post-excavation work is ongoing, but we now have all sorts of informative constructional details relating to the roundhouse and a range of artefacts and samples undergoing analysis. The Dinas Dintla roundhouse has readily, really captivated people throughout this project, and supported by CADU and the National Trust Neptune Fund, a decision was made not to rebury the feature, but to consolidate and display it. We took advice from a specialist in monument conservation on how to do this, and employed an experienced contractor to undertake the work. Gaps in the roundhouse wall were reinstated. Saved turf was used to plug gaps and create a soft topping. Stone pitching was added to the entrance to guard against uh, foot erosion and protect the deposits beneath, which were left in situ. A certain level of backfilling and landscaping with, was undertaken with excess spoil being removed and used to fill in erosion scars elsewhere on the site. 
Biodegradable erosion control matting was used to support areas around the roundhouse, and these were reseeded. Photogrammetry of the roundhouse was undertaken at several different stages of this work by Gwyneth Archaeological Trust. As part of the finalisation of the project, Cherish have commissioned reconstruction images from Wessex Archaeology. This is a draft version, but we'll give you the idea. It's a general view of the hill fort to be placed on the path approaching the site. A second cutaway view of the roundhouse will be positioned on site. This one draws on evidence from the various types of survey data and paleo-environmental investigation which has informed us how the landscape around the hillfort may have appeared to those living there. The outputs from the various stages of the project will be made available through Covlane and 3D models of the site and of the roundhouse are available to view via Sketchfab. There is already the outcomes of some of the work in print with no doubt more to come. I would like to conclude by thanking Cherish for choosing Dinner Stintler as one of their sites for trialling the Toolcritch approach. Their initial interest in and investment in the site sparked off a larger collaboration and partnership project, which has maximised the results obtained. Dinner Stintler is being used as a case study in climate change adaptation within the National Trust and elsewhere, and I hope that our consolidated roundhouse will help people understand the extent of loss to the historic environment at sites like this and the importance of adaptation through monitoring and recording. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Very interesting case studies, and also I think from Hannah's original introduction, some ideas of the creativity that's going into raising awareness through the Cherish project. Uh, the fourth presentation in this takes that creativity to another level, where we have two artists, Julian Ruddock and Pete Murnahan, who are going to talk about the creative response, uh, art, and cherish a conversation. Thank you very much. That's a very nice segue into our presentation here. Um, so... Uh, yeah, it's very nice to be here today, and thanks for, very much for inviting us along here to Dublin, uh, and for the opportunity over the last few years to work on the Cherish project. Um, I'm Julian Ruddock, Pete Monaghan. Uh, we've been visiting sites uh, both in the north of Wales and down in Pembrokeshire, and earlier into Ireland over the last five years. And we're responding to these places uh, and the remarkable imagery of Cherish as well. So both, both instances, really, uh, through our visual work, through our, through our paintings. And as artists, we're interested in the depiction of the environment, broadly speaking. Uh, it's our personal interpretation, our experiential reactions to this changing coastline. Art is, I think, uh, all about communication. So I think it's uh, just been so great to have us uh, to, to, to have the opportunity to, to uh, work with the Cherish team here. And Pete and I, we're not really plain air painters, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the tradition of going out into the environment and uh, painting directly in front of nature, although we do some of that as part of our work, I think it's fair to say, isn't it? So we've enjoyed the opportunity to go out sketching, working in the field, mm -hmm. talking with scientists in the field, um, and it often provides the sort of uh, an informed uh, uh, background to what we might do back in the studio. It provides a sort of sense of scale, a sort of a sense of the weather, a sense of the atmosphere, a sense of the rock formations of sites like here at Castellibach that you can see in uh, Keradigian. These liminal sites that are constantly in flux. And I think um, as artists, we look at landscapes with perhaps a different eye to scientists but informed by science in this instance. And through conversation, often in field work, you know, we've been able to develop the work that we have. And I think for you, Pete, this um, visit to Dina Stintley that we've just been talking about, that was really important in yeah. stimulating your work. That's right. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, the, um, as you can see, this is quite a lovely scraggly sketch of Dina Stintley. Um, we, um, We'd been speaking with the scientists and getting some loads of very interesting information. And I was sort of thinking, well, I'm not quite sure how I do justice to these sort of findings, you know, in terms of art. 
So, but when I actually went to Dinas Dintle, the landscape basically just smacked me in the face. Um, <clears throat> I was blessed with a glorious sunset when I arrived, and it always helps when you've got the weather gods on your side, I think. But I spent the next couple of days just sort of walking around and sketching and soaking up the atmosphere of the place. And, um, yeah, this was one of the sketches I did, which sort of led on to this painting, <coughs> which is Dinas Dintley, as you've never seen it before. <laughs> so um, when I got my sketch back to the studio, I think this was what interested me, were these sort of layers of history that were going on. So we've got the hill, Iron Age hill fort in the background, and the sort of eroding hill on the, on the right. But as we come down the hill, we've also got sort of uh, air raid shelter and public toilets, telephone box. And then we've got this sort of neon signage and flapping flags shouting at us to buy fish and chips and ice cream. And I just was really intrigued by that sort of brash contrast between, you know, people foraging and fishing earlier and nowadays we're sort of you know we're down in the car park and we're getting it shouting at us basically and yeah part of my interest it's been a, quite a long-standing interest is in um science images how do artists use science images i i've, I've looked at this issue this this interest for uh, on a number of projects because science produces such incredible images of our world we've got fantastic technology that's producing as we've seen today in lots of the presentations these incredible lidar images and scans of of the environment and so science technologies has always interested me it's this ability to see beyond human perception uh, and making the invisible visible somehow but how, as an artist, do you work with that, you know, that incredible digital technology very often? In this image, it's an image of Grasholm Island down in Pembrokeshire, and it's a LIDAR. It was originally a LIDAR image that I then went on to draw, and it's revealing this constantly changing coastline uh, of the island there, its contours, the rock formations, and it was made using um, uh, just ink pens, so it was, it was uh, blackened paper with quink ink that was then marked up with white lines that became like a continuous line and strayed from the science image to a degree. And I think that's something that artists do with the science images, uh, go beyond what the, uh, the original image was, was providing. It's giving us this bird's eye view, this altered perspective, isn't it, the, the, the original scan. And it surprises us, and it allows us to see landscapes a bit differently. And I was interested in what uh, Kieran Craven was saying earlier about these dynamic environments that we've been talking about today. And um, this image here, this LiDAR scan uh, of the SS Manchester Merchant uh, in the top corner there, was the stimulus for me to go on and then make some paintings based on this shipwreck um, the, uh, off the coast of Ireland there in Dingle Bay. And so for me, it added a sort of personal dimension to the data. It was a way of investigating the materials that I tend to work with. And in this case, what it was, I was using iron filings. Um, and I enjoy the process by which a painting can change and mutate over time. So by putting iron filings on, allowing them to rust, and then eroding back that surface with uh, uh, handheld uh, sanders and uh, all sorts of uh, tools such as that, it's sort of mimicking the erosional and the accretion processes that are going on within that natural environment. That's what my head is saying to me as I'm working these images anyway. Um, so I very much enjoyed working on those things, this, this sort of mimicking of natural processes. I think we, we should mention that we'll be putting the exhibition, I think it's already has been mentioned, hasn't it? Mm. But it's worth just saying again, we'll be putting the paintings up at about five o'clock this evening, so they'll be on view, and it would be lovely if people sort of came up and had a closer look. Um, so you see a lot more, obviously, when you get closer to the image, so we're, quite, we're both quite sort of um, interested in sort of just distressing the surface of mm. um, paintings and sort of building up and um, layering. And in this one, I was sort of, um, I was very keen to sort of link in the Irish thing. I've been to Kerry quite a lot and worked down there, but we weren't really getting a chance to go across because of restrictions. Uh, but in this image, I've 
actually, um, there are quite a few maps of the area that are layered into the background. Now, that just gives me a way of sort of working into a painting. Uh, so I've distressed the background, and then I'm not afraid of the blank canvas anymore. So I've sort of got something to work with. So it's almost sort of a, a slightly sort of throwing things into chaos a little bit, and then sorting them out, rather than sort of starting with something very definite. So this is all the Blasket Islands, and... Um, yeah, I was very taken there when I visited a few years ago by the sort of literature and the remoteness of the place. And uh, I think, it, you know, it ties in because it's one of the places that Cherish have been looking at. So, and I also was using bitumen into the um, uh, roof here, which uh, the islanders I'd sort of read since that the islanders were sort of using bitumen to cover sort of um, tarpaulin and make... Mm. Uh, Nice slidey roofs. Yeah, slidey horizon as well. Slidey horizon, yeah. Yes. yeah. And, and that use of bitumen goes on into the next painting as well, doesn't it? That's right. Because this is, we wanted to include this because Borth is very close to where we live. We live in Aberystwyth and we regularly go to Borth. And, uh, and it was a place, a location that we both worked on, but we worked on it in different ways. So Pete was providing this ground-based perspective, this sort of traditional view of a landscape. And I was getting very interested in the, in the aerial views. And in fact, when we started the project for five or six years ago, we were um, thinking of sort of dividing our work up into those two ways of working, weren't we? The we had that great meeting with um, Professor Henry Lamb and yeah. with Pat, Dr. Patrick Robson. Yeah. And we had great fun talking about And they were sort of giving us all this background history of why the landscape looked the way, what it did, yeah. and how it was likely to change in the future. And that was, for us, that was very interesting because we otherwise are just sort of looking at a relatively... Um, superficial, I guess, view of the landscape because we don't have that knowledge of, you know, that in-depth knowledge. And um, it was great. We had real good, really good. good fun and a good chat. It was a we? howling gale, but it was really good, wasn't it? <laughs> I was trying to rec record uh, Henry and Patrick talking and it was just hopeless. But, but it was a good visit and um, it provided us all that information that you're saying there, Pete, about the, the submerged forest, um, which we were then able to go away and then work on. Uh, and it's also about the, the community there. So I, I think it's something that uh, was informing my interest in this painting here was the... Um, the changing course of the River Larry behind Borth there, and the fact that that community in Borth is, you know, um, very aware of the future scenarios that are mm. likely to be played out in the next 50 years or so in, in coastal communities like Borth yeah. um, and Fairbourne, further up the coast. And so we were, we were keen to sort of uh, think about those, the uh, implications of these things on coastal communities. And, and I think partly this is about ideas around resilience and you know, this image I, I drew here of uh, Caldy Island is, I think for me, it's sort of symbolic of the climatic events uh, that are likely to, to impact upon us and on our habitation. It expresses our long-held relationship that we have with the coast. And so, again, this is an aspect of my work which is about uh, engaging with an original uh, image by Toby, uh, uh, the photograph, this fantastic aerial photograph, and then translating it somehow into a drawing and adding expressive content. So this is graphite on paper, is it? That's graphite on paper, yeah. Mm. So it's a very large drawing, and there's some examples of that in the exhibition yeah. that we'll put up later. And I was interested in that small patch that's there, visible there that you can see in the centre of the drawing, that small patch that's been marked out by humanity, and then and the dwelling and these small stones that are left uh, in, in that environment there. And similarly at Castle Martin, that just incredible landscape at Castle Martin, the eroding coastline captured through uh, drone footage and aerial photography. Um, and it's interesting perhaps to just think about this working across disciplines because this Cherish has been such an interdisciplinary project. And, you know, I'm an advocate of... Uh, taking that interdisciplinary practice across into arts as well because I think arts are just a fantastic way of engaging audiences in different ways. We bring different perspectives which are sometimes quite alternative and different yeah. uh, but they engage different audiences Absolutely. and you know uh, and that can be another way of discussing uh, uh, concerns around climate change. Yeah, just very briefly, this is another one of um, Dina Stintley. It's basically the same view, but I'm slightly further back in this one. Um, it's, the title of this is um, A Flock of Lapwings and, in brackets, Endangered Species. You haven't got the brackets on that. 
uh, I've been asked where the lapwings are, and I said, well, they were actually behind me. And that's, <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> and they were, they were with golden plovers as well, as, they, as they like, they're likely to, to hang out with. Um, and I thought, well, the, the, I love lapwings, and they're on the red list, at least in the UK they are. And um, I thought they're an endangered species. But also, these cottages that we're looking at in the foreground, and there's a whole row of them leading down to the, where the Iron Age hill fort is. Um, they're also an endangered species yeah. um, due to rising sea levels. And, um, yeah, so, so I think that sort of concludes it, doesn't it? It does. Do you want to, it we does. could go on for ages. We probably could. We could walk on for ages about it. But that's, uh, that's, that's about it for now. But thank you so much. You know, we're really sad this project is ending up because we've enjoyed it so much over the last five years. It's, it's been, been great. Really it's fantastic. It's been great fun, yeah. Fantastic yeah, good opportunity. opportunity. So, thank, yeah, you. thank you very much. So uh, hopefully everyone can go over there. So uh, we've got about 20 minutes before we go for tea. So time for questions. Shall we start with something from the Slido? Have we got a question? Yeah, we have a, a number of questions here. Uh, the first one is from Michael. Have the project partners, have the project partner participants encountered any climate change denialism during the interactions with the wider public? <laughs> Oh, have you, have you encountered climate change deniers during your interactions with the public? <laughs> Is that for all of us? Yes. Oh, um, <laughs> no. <laughs> I, yeah, I think, like, in chatting with the public, I've, I mean, like, yeah, I've never encountered anyone who's uh, a, a denier as such. Um, but there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of confusion around, mm. like, what climate change is, and that is changing. Like it's, I, I think it's really worth remembering that the Cherish project has spanned a really like key moment in time when Cherish started. These conversations were not as current as they are now, um, and people are increasingly aware of, of what climate change means means for us. But I think the key, like that that key confusion that comes in, is often regarding when climate change is <laughs> and so often it's you know been seen as like something in the future something that's that you know one day might affect our grandchildren and now increasingly people are aware that no this is happening right now but that is because of the work of projects like cherish that is because of this kind of climate change communication that's gone on mm -hmm. so um again like i think rather than encountering deniers it, it's about sort of gentle ways of 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 reinforming people or giving people the kind of relevant information that they need because it is scary and it is difficult to hear. Yeah. yeah, I would actually add to that and say maybe sometimes actually you, you almost encounter the opposite of that where people are so, sometimes you meet people who are so alarmist about it they think it's just, you know, but you say, you know, we can still do stuff about it. It's, mm -hmm. I guess you can become so alarmist that you become nihilistic about the actuality of doing anything, uh, which I've been guilty of myself in the past, but, but I think, you know, projects like this, they make it tangible. They show you the actual differences between projections and what's going on. So yeah, that helps. Thank you very much. So we ask the floor. Does anyone else have a question that, uh, who'd like to sort of come in? And then we'll go back to the to the Slido questions that have already been. Uh, oh, I see. Oh, you're going to move fast. <laughs> Weaving in and out. Very impressive. Uh, this is a question for Hannah and, and maybe for Julian and, and Pete as well. Um, can you hear me okay, yeah? Yes, yeah. we can okay, hear you. Great. Sorry. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, like, as climate change and the effects of that kind of accelerates, people become more uh, aware of it and sites more associated with immediate communities, sites on the doorstep of places, are facing imminent loss. They can't be, you know, there's no amount of conservation will save them. Is there a role, the, almost like a counselling kind of role, before the archaeologists turn up and do an excavation? Because that's almost like seeing a, you know, a loved one under an autopsy in a way, do you know what I mean? Um, is there an almost kind of palliative care kind of effort for some of these sites which aren't savable, in a sense? That's, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I, I guess I would argue that we sort of are. We are playing that role. Um, and I, do, I know what you mean, like, it, it is scary and difficult to see, like, have that conversation around, or oh, why are you excavating here? Oh, because it's, it's going to go. Um, it's, 
I think that is an interesting thing that archaeology is often quite misunderstood of like the fact that when we excavate, we're doing preservation by record. We're, it's a destructive um, mm. method of investigation. And what we're doing there is, you know, is, is, is um, preservation by record. But I think it can be, it can be quite helpful with archaeology. It allows a conversation around loss. Um, and there are sites that we're working on where the archaeology is currently being lost. Um, and in the future, uh, other things will also be lost. And, and those things will maybe more directly affect that community. Um, and so allowing people to engage with, with loss of archaeology in the present and with that long-term dynamic climatic change that we were talking about and these kind of these things that pertain to climate change but aren't, um, aren't an immediate loss of livelihood, um, I think is, is in itself quite a kind of, yeah, as I say, therapeutic mm. aspect. And I, I think the art probably has a quite an important role Absolutely. in that as well. It's that long view, isn't it, that archaeology provides. So it shows us that communities have adapted and changed, mm. and diversified and built in resilience. And, and so I think that long view it, it is sort of reassuring when you recognise that that's been the case that it's part of what we do with people. Yes, mm. it's urgent now, isn't it? But it's it's always been it's always been there for communities. Yeah. yeah. Nope. Thank, you. Thank you for that really interesting question. Do we have another one from the Slido questionnaires? Uh, yes, we do. We have a question from anonymous. Um, <laughs> what is the plan for future coastal monitoring at places like the Copper Coast after the Cherish project finishes? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, that's what we're trying to do right now is try and find funding for some continuation of what we've done other than monitoring that happens, I suppose. I suppose a local authority do some kind of assessment of the coastal erosion change as part of their, as part of, and they will do more of that actually going forward as well. And I think that overall in Ireland, we're, we're gonna see like local authorities play, I, I don't work for local authorities, I'm not speaking on behalf of them, but you're gonna see um, they have a mandate to do more on that in terms of assessment and mitigation as well. But in, in terms of our own plans as an organization, like, yeah, we're trying to find some funding to do something like this going forward. Uh, thank you. Do we have any more questions in the room? I'm afraid we're a bit blinded. Oh, we do, over here. Oh, over there as well, Derek. Well, over there first, but you've got the mic, and then the second one down here, please, yeah. Julia? Um, the, the use of the sort of limited palette of ochre and black and white in, across, your, across your pictures, is that something that's common in your work in general or was that something you chose to sort of convey the, the bleakness of the, the, the erosion <laughs> of the coast? That's a great question. I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the question. Can you just give me the feedback of it? Sorry, I, mean, I yeah. can't hear it. It's fine. It's like the tonality of our paintings, and I think that's something that it's been great working together on this project, right? Because we've got a lot of connections that we could probably talk about extensively about our practices as artists and we, how we've learned from each other. Um, and though, but those somber colours, those tone, those muted uh, greys and browns, and the majority of your paintings have been like that. Pete, it's true. You like that palette. Well, I, I think there are artists, very few artists who are intuitive with colour, and they really are few and far between. There are very few people who can actually throw some colours together and it works. You know, so I'm more of a graphic person, I think Julian's the same. So it's more about drawing for me. Everything comes from the drawing. And then after a drawing comes a, a tonal work, and after the tonal work come, come colour. And colours are then quite, um, you know, quite selective about colours and actually making them work together. So I might even work colours out separately. Yeah. Uh, so, but I, I, I'm getting better, but I can't really do it intuitively, I don't think. And it's funny when I look at all the fantastic images that uh, Cherish have produced of these fantastic coastlines, and they're all green and turquoise. Yeah. And then we're doing and this we where are, we haven't green. used green, we haven't used it at all. But, and I kept thinking all for the last few years, if I should use some green and get some colour in there. But I tend naturally to just gravitate towards that sort of palette, and I think you do as well. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, again, we could philosophize for ages. <laughs> yeah. There's no hard and fast about it, is there? And, you know, really, 
we, we both teach, uh, Julian teaches us a lot, and I teach a little bit, and one of the first things you teach students is to avoid green. <laughs> <laughs> Especially Viridian. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say, uh, looking at your work and what I found really interesting, because when you compared it with, uh, I can see Toby over here, his, his beautiful aerial photo photographs, which are you know, artworks in themselves, but I loved what you said about the idea of your art trying to demonstrate that sense of change and the impactfulness of climate change, because inevitably, with wanting to keep Toby and his pilot alive, you tend to go up in good weather. <laughs> and you're there when it's sunny and it's beautiful, and you see these photos, and it's all, well, everything looks fine. It's all calm and quiet. But of course, the actual structural effect of the climate change, the storms, the impacts of all of that, can perhaps be lost in the very clear skies of our aerial photographs, whereas your art brings that sense of movement, yes, I think. And I, I understand, uh, you know, scientists use uh, repeat photography a lot in order to, to be able to demonstrate change. I mean, that was true for sort of glacial retreat, wasn't it? And, and it's certainly true here, the idea of monitoring sites over time. It's just such a fantastic mm. uh, uh, tool that you have, isn't it, to, mm. to monitor change. Yeah. I think we had another question down here somewhere. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Could Hannah... Um, expand further on two of the points from her, her opening five points, community excavation and educating citizen scientists. Okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, so um, the community excavation that's been done, there's been a few over the project. Um, Cathy mentioned the one that was run by the Gwyneth Archaeological Trust up at Dinner Um So that was uh, largely like members, members of that community. Um, and and that was that's up north in Wales, um, and there was another community excavation down south in Pembrokeshire at Carvai, um, which was run, run for two years in a row. So the first was run entirely off the back of Cherish, um, like with in collaboration with um, a, a, an organisation called Dig Ventures, who run um, excavations around around the UK, and now I believe also in Ireland. Um, and in the following year was entirely run by Dig Ventures um, because they saw it as such a, an interesting and, and good site to get get people out onto, it was a um, really accessible, um, like physically accessible place to get out to. Uh, so a good, a good way to kind of train people up, a good, a good place for people to learn about archaeology who had never been on site before. Um, so, and that's, so that was um, some local people and then people from like further away as well. So uh, I guess maybe like local community and then a wider community of people who are interested in, in archaeology. Um, and then with the training of the citizen scientist, I think Kieran um, chatted a little bit about that earlier. That was to do with the app that was created um, in collaboration with GSI. That was their, their partners kind of le led on that. Um, and that's also kind of what Robbie's been involved with as well in, in this kind of, um, the idea of citizen science is um, getting people to gather data. So it's kind of empowering people to have skills to, to do science in person on the coast. Um, and that's great for, that's great for people because it gives them new skills and it gets them outside. And that's great for us because it kind of expands your team way beyond what you could do. Um, so that's, that's what those two things are led. And I don't know if you want to say anything more about it. I say something very tiny yeah. about it. I mean, the big problem with citizen science is that it's not very scientific. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is. Anyone familiar with it will, will know. I mean, it's, it's a challenge to produce something empirical with people. I mean, for example, in this, in this instance, uh, we were getting people to take photographs of, um, of anything that changed on the beach. But obviously, there's no fixed point for that photograph to come from, no fixed photog you know, f mm. f settings, no fixed. I mean, it's impossible to really, you know, to really track change scientifically. So I mean, that's a challenge that I, I mean, any scientific. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I mean, there are examples of successful citizen science projects, but they're usually very defined in scope, with something like a very like limited, like for example, folding proteins or something on a, on an app, you know. Or, but but to do something like such broad as this, I think it's a massive challenge. I don't know if anyone's really got anything to add to that, maybe. One, one thing that has been done in Wales is with the Cambridge Coast National Parks, they've set up their fixed, uh, fixed monitoring points, yeah. which are like fun like photo points on the coast where you can sit your phone on to take a picture, and that does that like allows a, a recreation of, of photos through time. I'd be interested to hear how successful that's been, whether it's been more so. Yeah, no, that's something that we, we actually were, were trying to do with this new project. But yeah, that's, that's something. But in general, I think it's, it's, it's difficult to, to do natural science in a scientific fashion with just loads of people. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Do we have any more questions on the, uh, the Slido? Uh, yes, we do. We have a question from Anthony Corns. What could be done to encourage more use of scientific data by artists and creative sector? that uh, I think a lot of science projects have um, outreach within part of their planning. And um, you know, it's, it's quite often a condition of, of funding to develop ways to, uh, to, to engage audiences. And I think, um, I think that's a really good thing. Over the time I've been working in, in this area of art and science, I've seen it really burgeoning a lot, actually. A lot of artists are working on environmental work these days, and they're doing it in ways that are, um, well, it's a huge range of activities from people who work very closely with science in terms of interpretation of science and communication of science through to much, much more imaginative ways of working with, with uh, the environment still, still allied to science. So I think education is a key thing, and I think... Um, more degree structures that work across disciplines would be a really great thing, so people can be educated through secondary education and degree education and postgrad through interdisciplinary projects. So innovative ways that people could um, study across disciplines, and I think that sort of thing would promote a lot, uh, uh, a, a richer way of understanding the environment rather than, you know, working so uh, minutely within, you know, traditional silos or, or disciplines? That answers the question. Can I, can I ask you a question as well on to that? Um, because it, your art reminded me of a really, really cool... <laughs> My very basic art vocabulary. <laughs> but, uh, but it reminded me a little bit of... Um, there's an Irish artist geologist called George de Noye, oh. and of um, some of his sketches from the 19th century of geological outcrops. Right. And I wonder, was there any kind of, I mean, obviously, any, from the, any, did you have any inspiration from that kind of era of scientific art yeah. when, you know, naturalists went out into the field and they had to sketch everything from birds to rocks with a kind of a Absolutely. very artistic eye. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think in those days, those areas had much more crossover. So, you know, um, uh, mariners would be trained in mm. drawing as a you know if they were exploring new coastlines they would be taking pens they'd be trained in art vocabulary so that they could uh, you know draw landscapes and then photography came along and replaced that drawing activity in some senses but the idea of the artist on expeditions has been around for a long time and I think drawing uh, allows you to select out from what you're looking at, doesn't it? The photograph captures everything, mm. and the drawing is essentially as capturing what is, is required. Yeah. And so I think it's that's... Distilling the, it's distilling the yeah. subject. So we talk about um, going out sketching, and you, know, you, you can take a photograph of the same subject, but doing a drawing of it is actually getting to know it properly, because they are, you're, you're looking and understanding you properly. You've got that eye-hand coordination going on, I suppose does allow for a different type of understanding, it would seem. It really does. I think if you draw, there's a, a drawing of the exhibition that's going to be on later that I did of a rock face at Druidston. I spent two months doing the drawing. And so if you're drawing those fissures and those little lines, you get to know the rock. And if you go then and visit that rock face, you can go, oh, look, I remember that bit. So it is a way of knowledge, gaining knowledge, isn't it, and understanding through this process we call drawing, because it requires so much focus. Well, I think you'll be talking to the converted in a room which has lots of archaeologists uh, ah, because I don't think there's an archaeologist here who would ever say that the, the art of actually doing the hand drawing is, it yeah. is the interpretation, isn't it? It's, it's the photograph is just the record, but it's yeah. how you then take that data That's and that, that yeah. involves that creativity, bringing your knowledge yeah. to the site, bringing your observation. Yeah. Uh, it's the same, but coming at it from different angles. So I can see Absolutely. how this work is you're really linked in with it. Yeah. Uh, we're practically, I think, at the tea time now. I'm just thinking, have we got time for one more question before we, we announce the quiz winner? What do you think? Uh, yeah, we do have one more question we could do. Um, it's again from Anonymous. Could be the same one, could be somebody different. Um, Very curious, this Anonymous. What do you see as the next steps for Dennis Dinsley? For, for what, sorry? The next for Dennis for... Dinsley. Oh, Dennis Dinsley, yeah. Um, <laughs> I suppose uh, the answer is we're not quite sure, <laughs> other than to find a way of continuing with the ongoing monitoring. Um, uh, we would like to, to you know, continue the, um, 
the excavation to do more along that cliff edge, but that's going to be very dependent on um, funding going forwards because um, obviously there's, the, there's a, a huge amount of funds needed both for the excavation, but then also the, for the follow-up, the post-excavation and analysis. Um, so um, I suppose that the next thing is to, to, to look for that funding and, and where we can get that support. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I think we're almost at the break. So, are we able to announce the winner of the uh, of the of the final uh, slider quiz? Yes, we are indeed. <laughs> uh, the answer first, I suppose. As an archaeologist, you won't be rich, you're unlikely to be famous, but you can help to save the planet. And the winner was Colin Dunlop. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm told that we've got, I think, half an hour, is it, for, for the coffee break before coming back for the final session. Please do get to the exhibition where you will be able to see some of the models and uh, things that were demonstrated here today. Uh, and we'll see you all back at, I think it's uh, half past three. <laughs>